It's all good watching films at home. But let's be real. There's only one place to enjoy the latest and greatest movies. And it's obvious. The big screen. This episode of Talking Smith About Film was initially broadcast live on YouTube uh, at 6pm on the Friday of Tenet's release day. Unfortunately, technical issues meant we couldn't present the whole thing live because it kept dropping out on my end. But here is as much of it as we could salvage. This is Talking Smith About Film. <laughs> Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to Talking Smith About Film, the flagship film podcast from ejacksmith.com. In a week where Kate Winslet and Sir Ronin set Twitter alight with their brand new film, the same week where we got DC Fandom, which was all good, and oh yeah, View Preston finally reopened. What else would you need from a movie podcast than a bloke talking about the works of Christopher Nolan? Well, not all of them we don't have the time we're doing three nolan movies tonight if you've been listening to the podcast feed over the last couple of days on wednesday to be precise we covered following memento the dark knight trilogy and inception as part of our nostalgic look back at the work of christopher nolan it's of course built up to today the day where we finally get to review tenet on this great podcast my name is jack smith it's an honor and a privilege to be with you on this friday evening the film is not out for another week in America, and we are very mindful of that, uh, which is why the review is going to be spoiler-free. Uh, and I totally forgot to press the record button as I did the intro tonight, so podcast listeners are going to have a completely different version of the intro. Uh, but that is irrelevant. We have a lot to get to tonight. We have two classics and one new one. We also have the film news rundown. We have the cinema diaries as well. Because, of course, views open and we got to tell you all about how they've made the office COVID secure. So, let's not waste any more time. Here are all of the ways you can get involved with Talking Smith About Film. You can go old school and email us at podcast at leejacksmith.com. You can submit your questions uh, on the blog too at leejacksmith.com forward slash submit. I can ask your questions there. You can tweet us using hashtag talking smith and at me directly at smith on film. We've got Facebook and Instagram. And both of those are at smith on film respectively. And if you are watching live on YouTube, rehearse is so much time. Just to the right of me is the live chat. I can see it right here in the studio on a screen just to my right but keep it spoiler free until I give the go ahead that's if you said tenet that is so let's get into our first review and let's cast your mind back to 2014 simpler times in 2014 Nolan made his first properly true I mean he's done a lot of science fiction in his films in the past but Nolan made his first true science fiction movie. Originally offered to Spielberg, Spielberg said, oh, I'm going to go and make Bridge of Spies instead. So he took a script that his brother, Jonathan, had been working on and made that middle movie on the top shelf. The last time we talked about this movie here on the YouTube channel, just the simplest bit of footage got us blocked worldwide. It was in Journal Episode 4. Episode 4 of the first series, for those interesting. We couldn't show the docking sequence. So hopefully, this trailer goes out unsaved. So, let's hope for the best. This is the trailer for Interstellar. Something socially responsible to do. Can't we just let it go? This thing needs to learn how to adapt, Murph. Uh, gang, let's mask up. Like the rest of us. There's 
world's a treasure. It's been telling us to leave for a while now. Your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on Earth. You're the best pilot we ever had. Get out there and save the world. Everybody ready to say goodbye to our solar system? To our galaxy. Here we go. Here. We want to get down fast, don't we? Actually, we want to get there in one piece. Hang on. We have a mission. Our mission does not work if the people on Earth are dead by the time we pull it off. We got this far, farther than any human in history. Oh, well, not far enough. Make it count. Where's the mountains? Those aren't mountains. The waves. I'm not gonna make it. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You might have to decide between seeing your children again future of the human race. We'll find a way who we always have. Well, uh, for our YouTube viewers, uh, sorry about that. Um, it went, we dropped so many frames on my end. We are back online now. Uh, but you've all seen the trailer for instead anyway. Uh, you'll get the full experience in the podcast version because we are recording everything locally. Oh, that got pretty scary. We were dropping frames like we've never done so before. But the stream is now stable, which is good. So, Interstellar. Let's give you a brief flavour of what this film is like. And I'm working from a very old review here. One that we've not respect. Um, up to the current standard, so I'm working from one of the really, really, really short reviews I wrote back in the day. Uh, a team of explorers travel through a wormhole in space uh, in an attempt to ensure humanity's survival. Now, as we mentioned before the trailer and before the YouTube stream went down, this is Nolan doing his first major bit of science fiction, and he had Kip Thorne working with him on this film which is the same case again for Tenant. We'll discuss a little bit more about that in about, I don't know, 45 minutes from now. But he had a lot of technical wizards working on this movie, not just in front of, but behind the camera as well. And this was also a movie made for IMAX. All of the clips that we are going to show tonight will be presented in the IMAX aspect ratio. Well, the ones that were issued on the Blu-ray, anyway. So you'll get to see the difference that that extra image makes. Because the clip that we have is how Nolan does a launch sequence. Again, not sure if this is going to get us taken down or not, but here's a clip. Main engine. 
situation to hand. Now imagine that on a five-story high screen with 12,000 watts of pure digital surround sound power. That is an IMAX film, if ever you saw one. So let's talk about this two-hour, 44-minute epic of a film. It is directed relatively well. It has room to breathe. It does have room to breathe because this is a very complex film in terms of quantum mechanics, physics, science. It's one of Nolan's heavier films in terms of its themes. And having that prolonged running time gives the film the room to breathe again. It's Nolan. We've talked a lot over the last couple of days about the way he directs his movies, very centrally based around time, memory, and the mind. His, uh, his production company is called Syncope, for God's sake. What do you expect? Uh, but it's it's a relatively well-paced film. It does the job. The way the set pieces are, done at, are handled very well. But the script, which is co-written by the brothers Nolan, Jonathan, who, of course, now best best known for showrunning Westworld for HBO. Brilliant show. Shame about the last series, though. Um, those two have obviously wanted to make this film for a, 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 a few years. A few years. Now, of course, the direction and the writing is like a small part of the Nolan experience because you have Hans Zimmer, on scoring GCs, he's using the uh, the mighty Temple Church organ in uh, in London. Uh, I know that because I've binged the behind the scenes on that like a freak when it when the Blu-ray came out. Um, you have Hans Zimmer who does a very unconventional sci-fi score, but working with Nolan for the very first time because Wally Pfister, cinematographer on, of choice, who shot Memento, Dark Knight, Inception, Prestige. Um, Fister was busy working on Transcendence. So he was a little bit busy doing other things. So in comes Hoyt van Hoytimer, who delivered the goods. A lot of handheld style work. He uses these IMAX cameras in ways that hadn't have been really thought about until this movie was released. The way these sequences are shot, a lot of it, a lot of it all is visual. A lot of it all is in camera. A lot of this film is shot entirely in camera, uh, with very little VFX. This is a film that belongs on a big screen, and quite rightly so, because some cinemas have been playing it in the build-up to Tenet. As for the cast, and I love the fact I remembered that bit from memory. As for the cast, this is a huge, huge cast, and so big. I, I couldn't make notes to mention all of it uh, in the initial review, um, but this cast is big. You got Matthew McConaughey at the height of the McConaughey's. You have John Lithgow. You have Timothy Chalamet, man of the moment. Uh, you have David Oyelowo, uh, Bill Irwin as the voice of Tars, Anne Hathaway, the legendary Sir Michael Caine, uh, Jessica Chastain, Casey Affleck, Topher Grace. Such a big cast, even Ellen Burstyn. But one of the talents that I was impressed with at the time, and again, she's had a, um, a big career since then. Uh, she would have been only 14 at the time of this film being made. Mackenzie Foy as young Murph. I mean, you see her in that clip then. She has gone on to do some big things. I mean, even though, even though Nutcracker and the Four Realms wasn't that great, the fact that she's had, in such a short amount of time, been trusted with leading Disney franchises. She, I said back then she was a talent to watch, and I stand by it now. I think we could be watching another Hollywood great being born before our eyes because she... She nailed it. She nailed the emotional aspect. And okay, everyone says if you work with Christopher Nolan that early on in your career, you're, you're, you are destined for big things. Now, Nolan said 
that 2001 A Space Odyssey was one of the inspirations for this film, and I I do not blame him. It There were moments that felt lifted straight from the Kubrick playbook. Uh because I've I've had I get to say I've seen both 2001 and Interstellar on a big screen in the same cinema, both before and after a refurbishment. It's a long story, uh, but I can see where the 2001 references come in with the organs, with the way the film shot, the docking sequence especially is one of those sequences that you have to see on a big screen. All right, for those of you who've seen the film, all I need to say is the words "No time for caution" and you will know exactly what I mean. But Interstellar is a film that was designed for the big screen, but it's not a film everyone's going to enjoy. You really do have to bring your thinking caps for this film, because it's go out and see it now. It's a go out and see it now. I hit the button early. It's a go out and see it now film, but bring your thinking caps and uh, maybe even a cup of the best tea in the world. <laughs> This, believe me, this thing, we'll tell you a little bit more about this in the Cinema Diaries a little bit later on, but for the view lot who I work with, they will have seen a lot of this mug over the last couple of days. And we are having all of the technical issues in the world here at Smith HQ, which is kind of gutting knowing the fact that this podcast um, is the big one. We're going to push through anyway, but to all of our YouTube viewers, if it's stuttering around, stay tuned to the podcast feed later on tonight. Because we are, like I say, we are recording this locally and we will have a version of this podcast uh, without any skip frames or anything like that. Because it's dropping frames like crazy. Like I've got my little preview windows in 144p. That tells you how bad it is tonight. I don't know what's causing this. So. The show goes on regardless. Film news rundown time. And where do we even begin with this week? I know where. With DC Fandome. Holy Batman. That's all I need to say. That trailer. Robert Pattinson has sold me now. I like where Matt Reeves is taking this film. I am loving the route that he's going to be going down. It's a lot darker, and we also know it's going to be separate to the other DC universes. This is a year two Batman. Uh, it has been confirmed by DC. So it's going to be a, an interesting, a very different like what, like what Batman Begins did the first time around. We've also got news on Shazam 2, The Suicide Squad, Wonder Woman 84, new trailer for that. A lot coming out this week, and we don't have the time to cover it all. Well, we do have the time to mention Mulan will be £20 for UK um, Disney Plus customers. Still a little steep considering the fact you've got to pay 6 99 a month to get access to the film and then the extra 20 quid, which you don't you don't even get to keep the film when you cancel your, your Disney Plus. That is shocking on Disney's part. If you get some of that billion in box office revenue, yeah. In other on-demand news, uh, Bong Joon-ho. Yeah, back in the news, his 2003 film that not many people have seen, Memories of Murder, is going to be getting reissued to UK cinemas on September 11th, uh, and it will be made available on Curzon Home Cinema on the same day. Following the success of Parasite, this is a film that's been very sought after on Amazon, with prices going up quite a lot for uh, bong high for fans uh, to really sort of see. It's good to get films more accessible like that. This one is one for Ed Greenberg. Evening, mate. Uh, Resident Evil, new series in the works at Netflix. If the film is running things to go by, he should enjoy it. Uh, we also have London Film Festival news. Mangrove, Stephen McQueen's new one, will be opening it. Ammonite from Francis Lee will close it. Good choices of films there. Uh, it's just a shame it's this year's London Film Festival is going to be going down majority without a crowd. Uh, Release date news, Bill and Ted release date side today. The UK cinema release will be September 16th. That is after Disney pushed the Kingsman back to February. Yes, really. Uh, but for those of you going off to watch Tenet this week, try and watch it after Sunday. Because from Sunday, they're going to be playing the June trailer in cinemas with an online version on September 9th. Right, and finally... Over 500 cinemas in the UK and Ireland are now reopened. The majority of Odeon sites 
89 view sites. Well, actually, 90 today because Berry's no, X is open and every City World site is back open, which is all good news indeed. We actually, film news run down. Oh, that was. Whew. That was genuinely scary. I didn't think I'd have enough music to hit everything in time. So, it is 10 to 7 on this Friday, the 28th of August. Uh, it is a very warm and hearty welcome back to UK cinemas this week. Um, and as we edge ever closer to the review of Tenet, we have one last Nogan movie in our way. And... Believe me, it's going to be an absolute joy to talk about this film because there are many stories. There are many stories I have about this next movie. This one here, if you're watching on YouTube. Let's go forward another three years. Survival was victory. That was the slogan for the film. Survival is victory. It's based on true events. It's best enjoyed with uh, Darkest Hour, the uh, Gary Oldman Oscar award-winning film that came out not six months after the release of this, this extra Nogan goodness. It's now time to talk about the film that he himself has said is a British story that can only be told with a Hollywood budget. Time to get patriotic. This is the trailer for Dunkirk. What has happened is a colossal military disaster. We shall go on to the end. We shall never surrender. We have to go to Dunkirk. Ready on the stern line. What are you doing? You know where we're going. Into war, George. I'll be useful, sir. What of ours? He's on me. I'm on him. The ship's about to leave. They need to send more ships. Every hour the enemy pushes closer. They've activated the civilian boats. Civilians? We need destroyers. Where are we going? Dunkirk! I'm not going back. We or they will die. You're weekend sailors, not the bloody navy. Should be at home. There's no hiding from this, son. We have a job to do. Turn it around. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall never surrender. We shall never surrender. We shall never surrender. Where's the bloody air force? give you a basic flavour of what this film is like. Allied soldiers from Belgium, the British Empire and France are surrounded by the German army and evacuated during a fierce battle in World War II. This is Nolan doing a war movie now. Again, a very different kind of film to the kind of things that we'd seen him do in the past. But ultimately, a film that he was wanting to make from the minute he did go Journey in the Little Boats when he was younger. As with the Interstellar review, which probably won't ever see the light of day on YouTube now, we're presenting all of tonight's clips. Well, this is the last clip because I've not put anything out for Tenet yet. Uh, but we're presenting all of tonight's clips in the IMAX aspect ratios were appropriate. 
to give you an idea of what these films look like on the big screen. So, this, again, it's a three-year-old film. I can use spoilerific content from it, and also it's just kind of true it's happened. This is a pivotal scene from quite late on in the film where Kenneth Branagh's character realises that home has come for them. Here's a clip. I hate having to cut that clip off very short, um, but we don't want to um, do too much in terms of, um, well, giving the game away. Nolan, up to this point, had carved a very rare reputation within the industry over the last 20 years. From humble beginnings with following the memento, all the way up to Dark Knight Trilogy, Interstellar, and lest we, lest we forget Inception, which I got to see in a cinema for the first time last week. Um, he had made everything, except a war film. And now, he went and did it. I said at the time that this would be the film that wins Nolan his Oscar. It's just a shame it was a very competitive year in 2018. A lot was... Um, was on the plate. And brilliant, we've lost YouTube again. So, I shall review this film and then we're going to bid YouTube farewell for the evening. Uh, yeah, well, we're, we're going to make a bold call. Uh, we will review this film and then this podcast will be exclusive to YouTube and we'll put it up, up at a later date. But Nolan plays to his strengths with Dunkirk. He directs the film with the same style and flair that we've all come to expect, which is big, wide set pieces with emphasis on practical effects over CGI. Uh, obviously, he shot the whole thing on 65mm film, which um, you, you can understand. Selected scenes also available in IMAX. Uh, this has the trademarks of g g the quality that you'd expect. Nolan wrote this one on his own. His shortest script to date, 76 page long script, the initial shooting spec was. Uh, it's my, my lacking dialogue. It has that same flair that we've come to expect over his body of work. It is tightly paced, it built to a very abrupt conclusion, but that's kind of the point of the film. Uh, it's a one hour, 46 minute film. So his second shortest film to date after following. Um, and you have the technical talent as well. Technical talent, we've mentioned Will on Interstellar. You have Zimmer on scoring duties, and it's a back-to-basics formula. Three themes for three individual acts. You've got Land, which is over the course of a couple of days. Uh, sea, which is over the course of a couple of weeks. Oh, uh, sorry, let me get that right. Land, which is the course of a couple of weeks. Sea, which is the course of a couple of days. And Air, which is the course of a couple of hours. There we go. Three individual plots that all come interlinking at one moment in the film. It's again, Nolan subverting our themes and our expectations. Um, the real soul, once again, is the cinematography from Hoy Van Hoytema. 
which utilizes the unique 220 to 1 aspect ratio to its fullest. So whether you're seeing it in 70mm, 35mm, IMAX, or the 4K digital print that a lot of cinemas are going to use, this is filmmaking done old school. This is cinematography that leaves you feeling stunned for the duration of the film. As for the cast, this really is an ensemble piece. The big names are supporting characters in this film. And with a cast that includes Mark Rylance, Tom Hardy, Kenneth Branagh, Kill- Killian Murphy, many audiences will see this film just for them. But they're going to be introduced some- to some incredible new talent at the same time. The standouts include Finn Whitehead, making his cinematic debut after doing a couple of shows for ITV in the build-up, uh, Anya and Barnard, Tom Glyn Carney, and surprisingly Harry Styles. Yes, Harry Styles off of One Direction. Uh, either way, this film is bursting with great performances. Um, so if you're a Nolan fan or a Directioner, you're in for a treat. Once again with this film, Nolan has proved why he's one of the best directors working in Hollywood today. He makes some great work out of this cast. And while he made this very niche story universal, Dunkirk deserves to be seen big and loud and to share this ment- to share the mentality of the man himself if your local IMAX is showing it get on it because it, again it's not quite masterpiece levels of quality but it is a go out and see it now kind of film <sighs> honestly we are having the worst night possible for technical issues. Right, on to the box office. And because of the technical issues, we didn't have much time to devote to the full top 15. So all you really need to know, Sonic was at 15th, American Pickle was at 14th, Invisible Man was 13th, Dirty Dancing was at 12th, and Star Wars Empire Strikes Back was 11th. Hit the music, music man. Time to do the top 10 properly. At 10th place this week is Baby Thief. It's in its second week now for Picture House Entertainment. Did £32,004 dead. It's up to £110,000 uh, from its current time in UK cinemas. At 9th is a new entry, Karate Kid. The, uh, the reissue from Sony with a lot of extra content. It did £32,117 from UK cinemas this week. Great to see audiences get a first for classics back on the big screen where they belong. And I want to see more of it. At eighth place is Dream Builders from Signature Entertainment, who've been advocates for the reopen. It did £33,261 from UK cinemas. It's up to just under a quarter of a million pounds. So it's done relatively well. At seventh is the reissue of Jurassic Park. It did £67,626 from the UK cinemas. It's up to £257,000 overall. Again, we had it on at view last week. Good to see it pull in the crowds and sell out. It actually sold out. At sixth is week number 20 for Trolls World Tour. It is £71,384 for UK servers. It's up to £472,786. Again, proving that video on demand has got no issues with the box office day during the UK because it still pulls in the crowds. Top five time. At fifth place is Pinocchio from Vertigo. Did £99,277 this week. It's up to £324,179. Again, doing very well. No issues there. Uh, fourth is 100% Wolf. 105000 this week. 498000 overall. Another verse go win. At third, this is big, is Inception's 10th anniversary, which did 117000 Overall, it's at four hundred thirty-two grand. What's number two, I hear you ask? Well, number two is Onward. Which is 142 grand to bring it up to 6.2 million overall. And that means Unhinged is back at the top in its fourth week of UK cinema release. It did 178 grand from UK cinemas this week. It's up to £962,191 from 500 sites. From 500 sites. Just saying the fact we've got 100 cinemas, 500 cinemas even, back open uh, is. It's really good. It's, enc- it's encouraging. It's promising. And that's what I really want to see from something like that. Now, a lot of you will be aware that the Cinema Diaries is our brand new feature that go- takes a look inside the big screen experience post-COVID-19. And last week, I had the honour and the privilege of being at View Preston, one of the most profitable cinemas in my area to see them reopen the doors after 
the lockdown. And it was brilliant to get back in there, believe me. So, what have they done to make a big screen experience COVID school at view? A lot of the same things that happened at real. So, a lot of you've 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 all seen the view press experience on the journal. We filmed bits for the uh, uh, for the journal there. We filmed the marathon there. We've done a lot of content out of that cinema over the last couple of years. If you even watch the Tenet First Thoughts video on Wednesday, you will see uh, what it's like. What they've done to make view COVID secure and sort of changes and how it was all set up. The manual doors, the other ones you've got to pull, that's your in side. Your automatic doors on the right are exit only. When you get into view, you're greeted by a member of the safety team who'll be wearing high vis, mask, visor, depending on what they uh, what they feel about the mask. Uh, you'll be greeted by a safety team who will ask you, have you booked your tickets yet? Do you want to buy concessions? They will then guide you to the cin- bit of the cinema you need to go to. So if you're buying these tickets on the day, they'll take you over to the ATM. Uh, go to sanitise, of course. If you buy any concessions, they'll take you directly into the queue line, and it's a big queue line. Literally half of the foyer is a big queue, queue line now, and it's never been like that. It's not been like that since the refurb. Uh, and then if you've already got your tickets and you don't want anything else, they will send you straight through to the gate where you can get your phone and scan your e-ticket. Or in my case, uh, just a quick visual inspection of uh, these these things. That was my inception. That was my tenant ticket. Uh, but what they've really made it seamless in terms of food selection it's a reduced menu because of course Covid has uh, screwed over in that regard um, so it's a reduced food selection I see, a lot of the assets are still there uh, they're still serving popcorn which a lot of you will be happy about they're still serving nachos which again a lot of you will be happy about I didn't spot any promotions for hot dogs though and that might be because of COVID or because they've not got as many staff in. I, I, I don't know. I will have to ask them about that. But the one piece of shambolic planning that the view got had was the fact that they did not have the best drink in the world in stock. You are hearing me right, ladies and gentlemen. View Preston were out of Earl Grey. That has never happened. So, I took some steps. It was... After last week, I took some steps. It was bloody expensive, and it was out of date by the time we got here. But I bought the same blend of tea that they use. Yes. I came prepared so it was all good in foyer staff are nailing it in terms of self-service because we mentioned this at the last talking to me about film podcast and our last juncture uh the self-service everything all the machines are in action what they have done is i thought well there's not really enough space in between the coke freestyle machines and the ice blast to warrant one meter plus well, they've put a mitigating factor in there. Uh, if you've been to a view at any point in the last week, uh, in the uh, 90 or so that have reopened, uh, you'll notice that they have invested in these um, Perspex guards for the tills. They've also brought them uh, for the concessions as well. So they've put Perspex guards in between each of the self-service machines, which is a nice little touch. So you get through food and drink, scan your ticket, into the screen as normal, uh, unfortunately, it is still half an hour of adverts and trailers in there, which, again, why am I not surprised? This is a major chain cinema we're talking about. Um, but it is an experience getting in and around that cinema nowadays. They're still playing the films loud. They're still playing them to levels of quality that I would have liked. Uh, and then... Getting out of the building was just a simple case of following the one-way system now. Toilet use, yeah, you can do that. Uh, now, one of the things that a lot of people have been calling them out on is the mask use. Uh, it's out of their hands, unfortunately. Uh, although they have said they aren't policing it, um, and I can understand why they're not policing it like other more high-risk areas. How do you know when someone 
has an exemption. How can you tell if someone's got an exemption? They can't really ask everyone coming in and out of the building whether they've got any medical history because GDPR exists. Believe me, I asked I asked them all of the questions when I was there. But I'm very happy with the way that, uh, that View have adjusted to COVID life. Uh, and now it is just a case of trying to get back in there and support our cinemas as much as humanly possible. And that reminds me, uh, we weren't on the air last week. Um, we weren't on the air last week uh, to talk about this. Uh, but our friends at Cinema First uh, put out a little trailer to reaffirm your faith in the big screen experience. Now, uh, the way things are going with uh, the YouTube stream tonight, this is going to be a pre-recorded podcast that you'll be able to watch later with all of the reviews restored and the box office restored. So this stream is going to go down uh, following the conclusion of of Talking Smith Bet Film tonight, and we'll have a fully, fully edited version on the channel by the end of this weekend. Uh, but as part of the reopening, all of the UK cinema industry have got behind this brand new campaign called Love Cinema. Um, so, to give you an idea of what to expect over the next few months uh, as we return to our palaces of the big screen. And before we're going to play this, before we do. The one you have all been waiting for. So before we review Tenet, here is a look, courtesy of our friends at Cinema First and the UK Cinema Association, at some of the films to look forward to at your local cinema. This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine to lovecinema.com to find out all of the procedures that the UK industry have put into place uh, as part of that cross-body effort that allowed the reopening to take place. So, whoo, deep breath. And I didn't see any dropped frames then either. Here we go. I've been nervous about reviewing this one, dear listener. I have been really nervous about reviewing this one. This first half of the review will be completely spoiler-free, so if you have not watched the film yet, you can listen to this review and you can watch this review knowing that we will be not giving anything away about the plot of the film. But now we have covered all of the major Nogan films. We didn't have the time to get to Insomnia because I've been busy all week. Literally finished Borderlands 2 yesterday. That means I can start Borderlands 3 next week. For, that's for a Jessica Goodsmith video. But it is time. This film should have come out on July 17th in the old world. Again, got moved back to July 31st. And then August 12th. This week, it finally came out here in England. And there was a lot of excitement and nerves in the air. Not just within customer-facing sites, 
but also with it in staff as well. Would it be worth it? Would it be worth getting people back into cinemas to see a brand new Chris Nogan movie? The wait is over. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast, it is time to review the film you have all been waiting for. I give you one last time before we start breaking this film apart. The trailer for Tenet. All I have for you is a word. Tenet. It'll open the right doors. Some of the wrong ones, too. Use it carefully. To do what I do, I need some idea of the threat we face. As I understand it, we're trying to prevent World War III. I'm not saying I'm again here. No. Something worse. I gather you have an interest in a certain Russian national. Mike, bring me in. You really want to know? He can communicate with the future. Time travel? No. Inversion? Name it and pull the trigger. You're not shooting the bullet, you're catching it. Whoa. Well, I've seen too much. Well, we'll try and keep up. Your duty transcends national interests. This is about survival. Seems bold. Bold, I'm fine with. I thought you were gonna say nuts. This is where our worlds collide. How would you like to die? Old. You chose the wrong profession. Where are you from here? Hasn't happened yet. There are people in the future who need us. I need a tenant. We need to save them here and now. This reversing the flow of time. Doesn't us being here now mean it never happened. You want to crash a plane? But not from the air. No one's so dramatic. Well, how big a plane? That part is a little dramatic. Well, watching that trailer back, having now seen the film, it's a completely different experience. Armed with only one word, Tenet, and fighting for the survival of the entire world, a protagonist journeys through a twilight world of international espionage on a mission that will unfold in something beyond real time. It is at this point that we would usually say, here's a clip. But because this film isn't out in America for another week, Warner haven't issued any clips for this film. So we're not going to dilly-dally. We're just going to get straight to the good stuff, which is telling you whether this film's any good or not. This is a long waste film. Got delayed three times, got pushed back for our American friends, but it's finally here. On Wednesday, my view team welcomed me back with open arms and a lot of elbow bumps uh, to review Nolan's li- latest. And yes, it is a good film, but there are elements that feel a little too bold for the first major Hollywood movie to have come out since the lockdowns began. So, where do we begin? 
Nolan writes and directs this one well. I say well very loosely. This is a film that is intense throughout. The script uses a lot of science fiction related elements. His, this is most science fiction heavy film today, if I was to say any more. It would ruin parts of the film. Uh, but not all is as it seems in this two hour, 31 minute epic. It does get confusing, even if you've read up on the plot, even if you've done your research and prepared for what this new Nolan experience is like. It, it, it does get confusing, but when you realise what this film is doing, when you realise how this film is going about telling its narrative, when you realise how this film is written, you will understand what we've got. You have to bring your thinking caps to watch this film to really understand what we've got here. The topic of inversion, which is not time travel. It is inverting the entropy of objects. I can say that because it was in the final trailer that uh, was in that had the Travis Scott song on it. To quote that trailer, don't understand it, feel it. That's the best way to describe this film. On cinematography duties, once again, is Hoyt Van Hoytimer, who's what we've known on the last three films. He has been an invaluable asset because he there are things in this film that I thought never were possible in terms of cinematography. You've got scenes that are legitimately shot both forwards and backwards and because Nolan, yes, they shot the backward scenes for real. It's not simply reversed. They actually choreographed it all and everything. But he, he absolutely nails it. And for the very, very first, well, for the first time since the Prestige, we don't have hands on scoring duties. You heard a bit of his score in the trailer we just played. But Ludwig Göransson, the Oscar winner for Black Panther works with Nolan on this film and it's very different to what you have ever experienced on a Chris Nolan film. More synth heavy. More hip-hop R&B heavy. But it works. Tonally, it works. And I cannot wait to get the hands on the soundtrack album when it comes out next week. Uh, it's a different style of music for a Nolan film. I do have some complaints, though. From a technical standpoint, it is great, but this is a very loud movie. This is a very, very, very loud movie. So much so that um, at points you can't hear dialogue. To give you an idea of how loud my local cinema are playing it, if you've been to the View Cinema in Preston before, you will know that there is a supermarket just across the road next to Frankie and Benny's. God rest its soul. Um, they are playing Tenet that loud at screen 7 the screen closest to that supermarket if you stand at the doors to the Waitrose that face the cinema you can hear the subwoofers rattling from that far away that is how loud we are playing it and this isn't even an IMAX cinema this is a conventional run of the mill cinema with 7.1 surround sound so Bring earplugs. Bring earplugs. I never thought I'd say that about a Nolan film, but bring earplugs, because you will need them. So, the cast. One of the staples of a Chris Nolan movie. As usual, they're brilliant. You've got John David Washington doing his father Denzel proud, continuing his stellar run of work that a lot of audiences were introduced to uh, with Black Klansman back in 2018. And that's how Nolan got wind of this man, a former American footballer. His, his athleticism is on show because he did a lot of stunts in this movie for real. Again, it's a Nolan film. You do your stunts for real. What do you expect? Uh, you got Robert Pattinson as Neil. Uh, he's proving his worth as a great actor. Uh, and the fact that this film came out now, um, just after we get the first trailer for The Batman, I can see why Warner's wanted to work with him a lot more. He's, it feels like Pattinson has finally put his Twilight roots to shame. He's done a lot of great independent films over the years. This will be the one that propels him back into the mainstream, ready for the Batman next year. And I, like, like I said in the film news rundown, which if you're watching on YouTube, you will see either tomorrow or Sunday. 
because we're going to edit all of this together and make it one coherent podcast. Um, he he's I I enjoyed Pattinson's work and he's quite a pivotal character in this film. Saying well, we're not going to say too much till, more until we get into spoiler territory. Um, he's proving his worth as a right actor. You've got Kenneth Branagh being Kenneth Branagh, transforming himself into a Russian oligarch uh, Sato, um, who is like your main villain of the piece. Uh, I know a lot of people have been saying Sato's not really a Russian name, but once you understand the whole nature of this film and the influences behind it, uh, you can really get a lot of the idea of why Branagh's character is called Sato, a convincing Russian accent. Uh, and supporting um, him as his on screen wife is Elizabeth Debicki. Uh, again, she's brilliant. Uh, one, one, one thing I did notice, and uh, having studied Nolan's films over the last god, nearly six years now, uh, having studied Nolan's films over the last six years, uh, it is good to see Nolan writing female characters in a decent way again, because Debicki's character again has a set very pivotal role in this film's plot. To say any more would be sacrilege. Uh, you rounding out the cast: Himesh Patel, Dimple Kapadia, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Clemens Posey, and of course, Sir Michael Caine, who legitimately plays a character called Sir Michael. I wonder if Nolan wrote it like that just to mess with him. This is a great film. But my advice to those of you going out to watch it this weekend: avoid the soft drinks. Get yourself something a little bit stronger, not alcohol something a little bit stronger is in a cup of tea and go and watch this film and then watch it again because if you watch it twice you'll be able to understand a lot more I'm going to be trying to get my second viewing in as soon as I humanly can but it's one of those kinds of big screen experiences so the verdict two and a half hours of pure sensory overload it's what audiences wanted to come back to their local cinema. And no one delivered that in bucket loads. People who got to see the prologue, the opera sequence, back in December will know exactly what to expect with this film. And they got to see this film do what it does best, which is get audiences into this new world. But is this Nolan's greatest from the perspective of a casual cinema goer? Unfortunately not. Inception remains the de facto masterpiece. But Tenet is the word and the film that can safely and proudly say to the world that cinema is back. The good films are back. That the big screen is back. Go out and watch this film. Go out and watch this film. Safely, responsibly, wearing your masks and socially distancing. But... I cannot stress this enough. You will feel confused at the end of it. You will feel confused. But once you understand the nature of this film, you can really identify with it very well. I didn't want to give this film a masterpiece rating because it's far from a masterpiece, but it is a go out and see it now kind of film. So with that being said, and I've not played this for a while... Spoilers incoming! It's time to talk about some spoilers. Uh, all being well, we should be doing a proper spoiler special podcast uh, in the next couple of weeks. I'm in talks with someone uh, from the old radio show days about maybe doing something for a spoiler special. If you listen to the Avengers uh, radio show I did, you might have an idea who I want to get for the spoiler special for, for Tenet. But this is a this is a confusing film, not least because half of it actually takes place in verse. Um, half of it takes place backwards. There is a whole sequence when you have the the time style sequence, 
when you realise, oh, so you got Kenneth Branagh's character in the Red Room, and you have David Washington in, in, in the Blue Room, and it swaps around, and it reverses time. That was such a well-executed bit of cinema. I was thinking to myself, has Nolan gone too much, Nolan? Because I was of the mentality that Tenet would just be a simple in and out film, with the inversion being the main narrative device. Well, it turns out that's not going to be the case. This inversion device is a it's a big big deal for this film because it's got what the whole narrative is, is built around. And once you know, once you've witnessed the whole element of the film, we you realise that the protagonist is reversed and then eventually Neil says, oh, I know more about this than you do because you've recruited me in the future. That was a moment where I was like, oh my God. I think, I think the best way I can describe it, Nolan has gone full Shyamalan. Nolan has gone full Shyamalan with this film. And I I have mixed feelings about twists like that because ten years ago he didn't have the balls to do such a thing. Obviously getting 60% of the box office revenue on the opening weekend to him directly helped a lot. But I, I'm, I'm in two minds about this film because the inner critic in me did... The, the inner critic me said it's a go out and see it now. But this is a film definitely made for film study students who are going to enjoy this movie a lot more than the casual audiences will. And that's as much as I'm willing to say in spoiler land for the time being because I'm, I want to do a full spoiler special once the Americans have the film next Friday and once the Chinese audience have the film. Once the film's out everywhere, it's f- fair game. But we're playing it safe because it's only the UK and a couple of other territories. <sighs> right. It's been an absolute nightmare tonight, YouTube viewers who are currently watching. Uh, apologies for the in and out nature of the stream. We will try and salvage this for uh, a properly good on-demand version with good audio and stuff. But that is it for talking sweet about film. Uh, for the live broadcast for now, we're going to be. I'm having a bit of a rest after basically doing a whole lockdown's worth of podcasts. Um, uh, so to the view lot who have watched this every week and co-written elements. Thank you all so much. Good to see you all back at office now. Uh, I'll probably see you all in about two weeks' time because uh, I'm doing a responsible thing and quarantining after every batch of reviews. Uh, for our YouTube viewers uh, who are watching this on demand, uh, we'll hopefully be back to normal soon on that front. Stay tuned to Good, uh, Just a Good Smith for our Borderlands uh, video gaming video because... Uh, we're doing gaming content now. I wrote the script for it the other day. Big price of recording voiceover, and I uh, finished Borderlands 2 yesterday, so it's all coming along very nicely. Uh, and of course, reviews will continue on leejacksmith.com uh, for the foreseeable future. So, that really is it for tonight. We'll be back to normal service very soon. But until potentially a spoiler special next week, maybe even a little later, my name's been Jack Smith. You've seen me intermittently talk about the work of Christopher Nolan. And until we're back together, we will see you back in the cinemas. Stay safe, wear your masks, and enjoy movies the way they are meant to be seen on the big screen. We'll see you soon, everyone. <laughs>